everybody, today's video is on ventilation. I'm going to be discussing why ventilation, or breathing as it's better known, is not the same as respiration. I'm going to be talking about the actual structure of our respiratory system, so the structure of the lungs, um, our trachea, etc. I'm going to be talking about the differences between inhaled and exhaled air. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about how we actually breathe in and breathe out. And I think I might talk a little bit about alveoli and diffusion as well. So actually quite a lot to get through, and let's see if it makes any kind of sensible order. Um, let's start by talking about the difference between breathing and respiration. Breathing is a mechanical process. It's just the process by which we draw air into our lungs and we force it back out again, and that is breathing. The whole point of it is to get oxygen into our blood and to expel carbon dioxide back out into the air so it can be removed. However, respiration is a chemical process which occurs inside the mitochondria of cells and it's the process which releases energy from our food. So respiration is a process, breathing is ventilation and it's about moving air in and out of our lungs and I hope I've cleared that up for you. But now I'm going to talk about the structure of the respiratory system. So our nose and our mouths are connected to our windpipe which we call the trachea and then that splits off into two branches called bronchi then those branches become even more split and even smaller and we call those the bronchioles and lastly we end in air sacs which we call alveoli and that's where gas exchange actually takes place. That's where oxygen leaves the alveoli and moves into the capillaries and carbon dioxide leaves the capillaries and moves into the alveoli. And I'm just going to tell you now that that occurs by diffusion. So if we take oxygen, remember diffusion is the net movement of gas from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So that will be oxygen moving from inside the alveoli through its walls into the capillaries. And that is diffusion. Remember that the alveoli are adapted to maximise the amount of gas exchange that can take place. They're very thin, one cell thick, so there's a short diffusion distance. They're moist, they have a very large surface area. And is there one more thing? Yes, they have a plentiful supply of blood capillaries, so those are four marks for you right there. However, let's now talk about how we actually get air into our lungs, so a breath in. And this is the same sort of language you're going to need to use every single time one of these questions comes up. So, breathing in. Now it's up to you if you want to talk about the internal and external intercostal muscles. I'm going to mention that for completeness sake, but feel free to miss out this first step when you're describing the processes of breathing in and breathing out. But when you take a breath in, effectively your internal intercostal muscles relax, your external intercostal muscles contract, and what that does is it forces your rib cage up and outwards, and that's the first mark I would really specify. I wouldn't talk about the muscle bit, it's quite hard. Just talk about your rib cage moving upwards and outwards. At the same time, your diaphragm contracts, and what it does is it flattens, and effectively that creates a much larger volume inside your chest or in your thorax if you're feeling fancy. Because you've increased the volume inside here, effectively the pressure has decreased, so the pressure outside, the atmospheric pressure, is much higher, so air is automatically sucked into your lungs. So let's talk through the marks I would specify again. Your rib cage moves upwards and outwards, your diaphragm contracts and flattens, the volume inside your thorax increases and the pressure decreases, causing air to be sucked into your lungs. If we look at the opposite argument, when we breathe out, you can just say exactly the opposite. So if you're feeling like you want to talk about internal and external intercostal muscles, remember this time the internal ones are going to contract, the external ones are going to relax, your ribcage is going to move down and inwards, your diaphragm will relax, which will mean that it will move up. That creates much smaller volume inside your thorax, causing the pressure to be raised inside your thorax. And that means that therefore the pressure inside your chest is higher compared with the atmospheric air surrounding, so air is forced out of your lungs. So just to reiterate, your ribcage moves down and inwards, your diaphragm moves up, your volume inside your thorax becomes less, the pressure increases, so air is forced back out of your lungs. Job is a good one, and I'm going to add a summary here. And as always, I'll add questions to the end of this video to show you how you need to answer them. If we talk about the differences between inhaled and exhaled air, remember that's the differences between air breathed in versus breathed out. Obviously, air that's breathed in is going to have more oxygen in it, 
it's going to have a little amount of carbon dioxide in it and it's going to have a very normal amount of nitrogen which is around 78% and a little bit of water vapour. However, air that you've breathed out, because it's going to be carrying now the products of respiration, will have a much higher percentage of carbon dioxide. Because all that oxygen will have been used in respiration, the air breathed out will have a much lower amount of oxygen. The amount of nitrogen, however, will be unchanged because that nothing happens in your body with the nitrogen. And lastly, the amount of water you breathe out will be far greater due to the fact that respiration produces water which needs to be removed from the body. I think that was everything I wanted to talk about. I hope you found the video helpful. And don't forget to subscribe and like if you want more similar things. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Question 6. Doctors use x-rays to produce images of the structures inside the body. The image shows an x-ray of a normal human thorax. Identify the structures labelled A, B, C and D. Don't panic, I know it's a bit confusing because it's an x-ray, but we can work this out. So, structure A, the obvious thing here is to say that it's a lung. Um, you can specify that it's the right lung, or if you're keen to label what the exact um, line is pointing at, you could say that they're intercostal muscles, but you need to say the word intercostal to get the mark there. So for me, it's far more straightforward to say lung. Let's look at B, because it's the white portion, we know that those are bones and the bones that you find inside the thorax are the ribs, so you could write here ribs or rib cage. C, that's the shadow behind the sternum and it's, the shape of it's quite awkward but it's kind of round and you know what's, if you put your hand there you can feel it, so you need to specify there that it's the heart. And then for D, it's the sheet of muscle that is at the bottom of the thorax and that means it therefore has to be the diaphragm. Describe how structures B and D help a person to breathe in, so let's just identify them quickly. So we're talking about the ribs and the diaphragm. So when we're breathing in, remember that the diaphragm contracts, which means that it flattens. The rib cage moves up and out, and what that means is together they increase the volume inside the thorax. By increasing the volume, you're decreasing the pressure, and what that causes is air to be sucked into the thorax. So for the first mark, the diaphragm contracts, second mark, it flattens, third mark, the rib cage moves up and outwards, fourth mark, the volume inside the thorax increases, and fifth mark, there's a decrease in the thorax pressure. Eight, the diagram shows a model that can be used to demonstrate how the lungs inflate. So you've got balloons representing the lungs, you've got a rubber sheet representing the diaphragm. So suggest which, which part of the human thorax is represented by Oh, intriguing, I accidentally just said that. So yeah, the balloons are the lungs, the left and right lung. Just write the lungs here. The rubber sheet, like I just said, is the diaphragm. Tube A, right, let's have a look at this. Okay, it's the main tube. You've got to remember that that is the trachea or windpipe, whatever you say. Whatever you do, don't write esophagus there because that is the food pipe. So yeah, answer for A is that it's the trachea. And then lastly, tube B, it's where the trachea branches. So these are there for the bronchi or the bronchus. Describe and explain what happens to the balloons as the rubber sheet is pulled down. Okay, use your common sense here. Let's have another look. So, when the rubber sheet is pulled down, then the volume inside the bell jar increases. And that's because the... And then that leads to the pressure decreasing inside the bell jar, leading to the balloons inflating because air is sucked in. So, for the first mark, say that the volume inside the bell jar increases, say that the pressure decreases, and that lastly, the balloons inflate. Explain why the model does not fully show the mechanism of breathing in in the human thorax, and that's because we're missing lots of things. We've got no rib cage, we've got no muscles, we have no pleural membranes, and there's no movement of the chest up and out. During an experiment you could carry it to, oh, describe an experiment you could carry out to investigate the effect of exercise on breathing in humans. Right, okay, I don't like these questions, but what you could do is you could do a mixture of resting and exercising. You could count how many breaths you took over a certain amount of time, and then you want to obviously repeat it to improve the reliability of this, and you should specify what kind of exercise you intend to do, whether it's press-ups or jogging. So you want to do a comparison between resting and exercising. You want to count the number of breaths over a certain amount of time, like 30 seconds. You want to specify the type of exercise, and lastly, repeat. Question two, the diaphragm and rib cage move air into the lungs and out of the lungs. The graph shows changes in the volume of lungs in one breathing cycle. Describe the changes in the volume of the lungs in one breathing cycle. You're describing, therefore you're saying what you see on the graph and it's worth three marks to so make three separate points. So first of all, you want to say that the volume of the lungs increases and then decreases. The maximum volume occurs at 1.2 seconds and after that point, the volume decreases all the way down to zero and that occurs at about 2.5 seconds. 
Explain how the diaphragm and ribcage cause the changes in the lung volume shown in the graph. Right, first of all, the volume of the lungs increases when the ribcage moves upwards and outwards and the diagram, diaphragm flattens. You want to say that the lung volume then decreases when the diagram moves back up and the ribcage moves in, causing the volume to decrease. 2b. Sometimes patients are unable to breathe for themselves. Mechanical ventilators are used to make these patients breathe. In photograph 1, we've got an image of an iron lung. Air is pumped out of the iron lung, creating a very low pressure. This low pressure causes the thorax to expand, causing air to flow into the lungs. When air is pumped back into the iron lung, the pressure inside the tank increases, causing air to move out of the lungs. Photograph 2 shows a modern ventilator. Modern ventilators increase the pressure in the patient's airways using a tube put into the trachea. The increased pressure in the patient's airways causes air to flow into the patient's lungs. Then the ventilator causes the pressure in the patient's airways to drop to zero and the patient breathes out. The ventilators shown in photographs 1 and 2 make the patient inhale in a very different way. Describe the difference. So we've read a lot of information. It's quite confusing, but don't worry too much. It's only worth two marks. But if you can spot the fact that with the iron lung, it's the atmospheric air pressure which forces air into the lungs. Whereas in the modern respirator, the air is forced mechanically into the lungs, and that's the main difference. The iron lung ventilator was used mainly in the 1900s. Most patients are now treated with the type of ventilator shown in photograph 2. Give one advantage and one disadvantage of using the modern ventilator rather than the iron lung ventilator. So let's provide an advantage. First of all, there's more freedom of movement for the patient, because you can see from the iron lung diagram that they're very much just stuck in the box. You could say it's more portable. And if you wanted to, you could say that it doesn't affect the blood flow in the lower body. However, disadvantages must be really hard to um, cope with the fact that you've got a tube in your trachea. So imagine that piercing through, not very comfortable. And it's also more difficult to eat and talk using the modern ventilator. Question six, figure five shows the model representing the human breathing system. The different parts of the model represent different parts of the human breathing system. Which part of the human breathing system does the flexible rubber sheet represent? That would be the diaphragm because we can see that the balloons of the lungs and the glass bell jar are the ribs. And so it makes sense that the rubber sheet is the muscle sheet at the bottom of our thorax. Explain why the balloons inflate when the flexible rubber sheet is pulled down. Three marks, so make three separate points. You want to say that when the rubber sheet is pulled down, the volume inside the glass jar increases, therefore decreasing the pressure and therefore air is sucked into the balloon. Describe breathing. During breathing, dimmy, oxygen moves into the blood. Explain how oxygen moves into the blood. It's important here that you identify that that is by diffusion. Remember diffusion is from the net movement of gas particles from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So you want to say that the high concentration is in the air and that the low concentration is in the blood. Figure 6 shows a fish head and gill. Fish absorb oxygen from the water. Oxygen is absorbed through the gills of the fish. Explain one way in which the gills are adapted for rapid absorption of oxygen and that is worth two marks. Okay, you can start by saying that they have many gill filaments and you need to mention the word filament to get the mark here and what that does is it creates a large surface area. However, there are lots of different options. You could say that the gills are very thin to provide a very short diffusion pathway or you could say that there's a very good blood supply to maintain the concentration gradient or you could even say that the water continually flows over the gills, again maintaining the concentration gradient but for me, the most straightforward answer here is that they're thin to allow short diffusion.